waiting for a, a, a priest to make an entrance in the second act and administer the last rites. Oh, come on, Tony. The audience loved us. Five curtain calls. For God's sake. This bunch of hicks would give five calls to a lecture on paint thin. But you know what the New York critics are going to say? We are a sentimental cartoon. We would have been out of date in the 30s. Well, I don't know about the rest of you. I don't need that on my resume. Mel. The first act closer still doesn't work. The song is old fashioned. The, the lyrics are maudlin. The whole concept is it's prehistoric. I've told you a hundred times we need something tougher. All I hear is, yeah, Tony, sure. Well, I want to hear a new song. I want to hear it by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Well, of course I'm not. Something like Anybody. Okay, Mel? Yeah, Tony, sure. Shouldn't be too hard. Old score sounds like it came straight from your trunk. Would somebody mind telling me why six? Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six of our hookers made their entrance late in the police raid. Kate, you're choreographing our little funeral here now. Is it too much to ask your hoofers to make their entrance on cue and not whenever they damn well please? Tony, they have a really big change there, and it's not their fault that the they're damn... The intercom, Tony. I beg your pardon? The intercom system wasn't working by the time I got backstage to the dressing room. And, and whose responsibility was it to see that the intercom system was working? Well, you know, I had a lot of new light cues. I uh, just asked you a question, Johnny. Okay. It was my responsibility. Oh, like it was your responsibility to make sure that there, there was a pianist at the understudy rehearsal last week? Yes. You are a flake. That's not fair, Tony. If you don't get your shabby little act together, I'm going to make sure you end up swabbing out toilets in some crummy little dinner theater. You've got no right to talk to me that way. Why not? You don't have the guts to do anything about it. Oh, yeah? Hey, what are you doing? Hey, Johnny, for God's sake! Stop it, will you? Come on. For God's sake. You are fired, Whitman. Tony. You will never work another Broadway show again. You hear me? Never. Hey, come on, Tony. Come on. Johnny's a hell of a good stage manager. You know that. You just got him a little crazy, that's all. You two just cool off, and then we'll sit down and talk this over, all right? I'm running this show. You get a problem with that, you get yourself another director. I'm sorry, Johnny. I really am. Somebody ought to drive a stake through your heart. You? Yeah, maybe.
All right. James? Our crucial scene just kind of lies in the middle of the road like a dead dog. I mean, it's not funny. It's not moving. It's not anything. I think your TV roots are showing. And they're not very pretty. I want it rewritten first thing in the morning. We'll get it rehearsed and into the show by tomorrow night. And while you're at it, look at that first scene between Tom and Amanda, because... Polly Abbott, she was a real woman, not some cheap Mae West impressionist. I thought the scene played pretty well. Well, as usual, you're wrong. Damn it, Tony, you are the most insensitive, insulting, arrogant... Oh, listen person. up here, kiddies. Our fading star, the silver screen, she actually can display an honest emotion. You're a pig, Tony. I'd like to reciprocate. I just don't want to waste my time. All right, that's it. <clears throat> Sorry, fella. Wish I could help. Aren't we? Stella, do me a favor. Don't use the word we. Has the doctor been by yet to release you from the hospital? 
Dope. <laughs> well, we better get you out of here soon, or you're not going to be fit to reenter. Johnny Whitcomb, stage manager of the musical Holly, is being taken into custody for the murder of the musical's director, Tony Franken. Now, Whitcomb publicly threatened Franken's life just hours before the murder, which took place at the Paramount Theater at 2.30 a.m. Witnesses in the neighboring building say they heard the shots at that time, but failed to report them. We'll have details in there. What's the matter, Perry? Do you know this, Franken? No, but I know that boy didn't kill him. How? I saw him. What's his name? Whitcomb. Right under that street lamp at the time of the murder. Are you sure? I remember looking at my watch as he was standing there, and the theater where this Franken was murdered is at least three or four miles from here. What are you going to do? I don't know. It'll likely be a rain this morning. Well, as soon as the doctor releases you, you can just go down and clear the boy. I'm afraid it's not that simple. Just tell him what you told me. Any halfway decent prosecutor would tear me apart. I don't. But Della, get my clothes for me, will you please? I'm going downtown with you. Good. Then you can watch me make a world-class fool of myself. Let's see, Mr. Macy. You believe you saw the defendant on that park bench at about 2.27 a.m., is that right? Yes, I looked at my watch. But you were in a hospital about how many yards away? About 30. And although it was overcast that night, you believe you could make out his features by the streetlight? Yes, I believe so. How was the man you saw dressed? He was wearing the same clothes he has on now, plus an overcoat and a hat. Weren't you in the hospital for some sort of knee surgery? Yes, an arthroscopy. Mr. Mason, were you given some sort of sedation or painkiller before you went to sleep that night? Yes. And that would have been 40 milligrams of oxalidine, wouldn't it? Actually, I'd taken 20 milligrams at 10 p.m. simple yes or no will do. Did you ingest 40 milligrams of oxalidine? Yes. Mr. Mason, is it your testimony that on a moonless night from a hospital room 30 yards away, after ingesting enough medication to put most of us in a coma, you're able to identify this defendant, a stranger whose face you've never seen before, as the man you saw in the park in the middle of the night? Yes, I believe it to have been him. Further questions. The defense rests, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. On the basis of the evidence presented here, this defendant shall be bound over to Superior Court for trial on March 15th at 8.30 a.m. Bail shall continue in the amount of $250,000. So after I left the theater, I bought myself a bottle of whiskey and just wandered the streets. For a couple of hours, maybe. I guess I was just trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. Do you remember where you went? No, not really. I've never been in this town before. I do remember going to the park. I broke my bottle. I'm glad I went there or you wouldn't have seen me. I'm afraid that doesn't help as much. Well, anyway, after that I went back to the hotel maybe about three. Bought myself another bottle and drank myself into oblivion. I don't remember anything after that. I told the police. I found it on my door at about 7.30 this morning. And found the gun in your room. Mr. Mason, I swear I never saw that gun before. It's a terrible tragedy. And I know how shocked all of you must be. Nevertheless, I intend for us to open in New York on the 3rd of next month. As 
morning, I phoned Gavin Austin. He's flying in from New York today to take over as director. Most of you know Gavin, and I'm sure you share my faith in him. We'll see the show tonight, and I've called a rehearsal for him at 10 o'clock tomorrow. We've got a great show here, kids. And although we'll all miss Tony, the show, as he would have wanted, will definitely go on. Right now, Mel and James will fill you in on the new material, all right? Mason, I'm Amanda Cody. I know. I've admired you for years. Uh, and so have I. Thank you. This is my associate, Della Street. Of the street? Hello. Please, it's Della and Perry. Uh, Perry, is there any way I can convince you to represent Johnny? I've, I've called my attorney on the coast, but he isn't a criminal lawyer. After all, you're right here in town already, and I just... Johnny's a very decent young man. He couldn't have done such a thing. I don't think so either. And I am representing him. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, I mean, Johnny will be so pleased. Mr. Mason, my name is Blaine Counter. I'm the producer of Polly. Is there anything I can do for you? I'm Johnny Whitcomb's attorney. My associate does street. How do you do? Really? You know, I'm arranging Johnny's bail. Oh. I'll see you both later. We'll look forward to it. Uh, excuse me, but I'm going to go make those calls. Oh, try and locate Ken Melansky. I need to talk to him. Mr. Counter, do you have any idea what Franken was doing here at the theater at 2.30 in the morning? No, I don't. But I just fired the security guard who was supposed to be here all night. Uh, Parker, somebody. A moron left the place at midnight to go see his girlfriend. Where did he come from? Some local employment agency. I don't even know his last name. I'd like the agency address. Oh, of course. I overheard you saying that the production will continue. Yes, it will. But uh, not because of the old showbiz tradition. I happen to have a lot of my own money invested in it. I had extraordinary faith in Polly. I still have. Without Tony Franken? Well, we've still got Amanda Cody. She'll sell a lot of tickets. Oh, I'm sure of that. She's wonderful. Even last night. Last night. What about last night? Well, I was given to understand that she uh, had a very upsetting call from the coast. But on stage, she was superb. Watching your company just now, I didn't see much evidence that Tony Franken would be missed. Tony Franken was a brilliant theater man.
Well, I figured Whitcomb must have called him with some cock and bull story. Mind showing me where you found the gun? Room 511, Ray. That was Whitcomb's room. Now, the gun was right here behind these soft drink bottles. And who found the body? The cleaning crew from the theater at about 7 in the morning. Who told you about the threat Whitcomb made to Frank? The producer of the show, Mr. Counter. He called him and asked him to come down to identify the body. He told us the whole story. Luring Frank into the theater sounds pretty complicated since that was Franken's room right there. And this is Johnny's room right here. But a shot would have wakened the whole hotel. And since Franklin was right next door, Johnny probably could have heard that he had a visitor. That visitor could be very important, wouldn't you say, Lieutenant? Miss Mason, a Miss Treat called for you. She left this message where you could find a guy called Molesky or something. Polanski. Thank you, Ray. You'll let me know about the prints on that glass. Will do, Mr. Mason. Thank you for your help. Now, Mrs. Pitts, you heard Mrs. Gilman testify that at approximately 9.30 p.m. on the night of March 3rd, your son, Walter, held her up at gunpoint and stole $173 as well as forcing her to remove and hand over her underpants. Now, I ask you, Mrs. Pitts, where was your son, Walter, actually on the night of March 3rd this year? We was at my house, looking at TV the whole night. The whole night? Could you be a little more specific? Well, Walter come over just as Vanna was given a car away on Wheel of Fortune... And he didn't leave till right after Johnny Carson's monologue. You see, Johnny had Alan Thick guesting, and Walter don't like him a lot. Thank you, Mrs. Pitts. No further questions. Thank you, Mrs. Pitts. You can step down. You are excused. I call Father Alan Rooney. Do you solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do. State your name for the record, please. I'm Father Alan Rooney. Father Rooney, where were you on the night of March 3rd? I was at St. Sebastian's Church, as I am every Thursday night, calling the numbers. Could you explain that, Father? We have bingo every Thursday night uh, for the benefit of the homeless, don't you? And did you see Mrs. Pitts there that night? I certainly did, son. In fact, she won $25 in the very last game. Just before 10 o'clock it was. No further questions. I'm sorry, Barry. It's not your fault, Father. God forgive me. He's just no good. You're a pervert, Walter, and you always have been. You steal ladies under there. Pitt. And you make me lie under God's Mrs. own. Pitt. I hope they put Mrs. you away for a hundred years. Objection. Any cross-examination, Mr. Molensky? Huh? No, Your Honor. I'm ordering a ten-minute recess at this time. Lansky, in light of the testimony, I suggest you confer with your client and decide how you wish to proceed. I sincerely hope that you personally will have learned something from this uh, shabby chapter in the history of American jurisprudence. I'm real sorry, Mr. Molansky. Look, if you give me some time, I'll give you back the 500. I swear. 500. What 500? The 500 she gave me to give to you. Amy? Look, you weren't getting any clients, so I went down to the police station, you know, and I saw poor Walter here getting arraigned, and he looked so innocent. And he couldn't afford a lawyer, so... Yeah, and I already spent the money I stole from that dame. 
Great. Can I talk to you outside? Just perfect. You bought me a client? How do I know what's going to turn out? I just don't want you buying me clients. I don't care how much money you got. If I can't make it on my own, then I can't. And that's that's it. How many other clients you paid for? I've only had five since you opened the office two months ago. Six. Six clients. And how many of those did you put on your credit card? <laughs> Don't be so... Oh, look who's here. Amy? Ken? How's it going? Uh, just wrapping up some trial work. Ken was terrific. I'm sure he was. How's your practice coming along? Some days are better than others. I lost my first seven cases in municipal court. Two of them were real embarrassments. You were there. You peeked in for a minute. Have you uh, heard about the Tony Franken murder? Hard to avoid. It's been all over the papers and TV. I'm representing the young man they arrested. Did he do it? Amy. It's a fair question. No, he didn't do it. Meanwhile... I could use some help if you have the time. I'm flattered. We'll fit it in. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Mason, if Ken's going to work on this case, then couldn't you make him co-counsel? Not on this one. Don't mind her, Mr. Mason. She means well, but sometimes she's a little pushy. What do you need? I need some investigative work. I'm never pushy. Great. Just tell me what to do. Well, they hired a local as night watchman theater who left his job the night of the murder to see some girl. Uh, find out about him. His not being there that night sounds just a little too convenient. Great. We'll get started right away. She can be your Della Street. Not a lot. No, they're all pretty much in the pop guy. Anything more on Tony Franken? show Tony hadn't worked for over three years. Evidently, the producers didn't want the aggravation. I encountered it. I wonder why.
You really do think that I might have killed him. But why would I? Maybe because you knew Tony Franklin was planning to replace you in the show. We heard you'd received a disturbing call from the coast, so on a hunch, Della contacted your manager. He was unhappy about being fired and very, very talkative. My ex-manager has a very big mouth, and he probably told you that Tony and I didn't get along too well, but then nobody got along with Tony. But I didn't kill him, Phil. And I know Johnny didn't either. You seem very sure of that. Some things you just know when you got. It seems to me that being replaced would have been very painful for you, wouldn't it? An earthquake, my friend. You said you were a fan of mine, but I'm sure you haven't seen me at your neighborhood movie theater lately. You see, this business can be pretty rough on old broads like me. <laughs> I'd say that time has been very kind to you. Thanks. Well, if you'll excuse me, they want me back on the stage. We must get together sometime and have fun. I told you, it's the policy of this agency to respect the privacy of its clients. I don't want his tax return. Just his name. Parker what? I'm very busy and I don't have time to argue with you. All right. This is confidential, but I'll tell you the real reason why I need to talk to you. While he was working at the theater, several of the actors reported having valuables stolen from their dressing rooms. Now, I'd like to ask this Parker some questions. I'm sure you'd like the police to know that you cooperated fully with our investigation. Yes, of course I would. Good. But you are not the police, and I would appreciate your leaving before I call them and charge you with harassment. simple thing and I strike out. His name's Parker Newton and he was kicked off the police force for brutality. He lives at 552 Morgan Street, apartment 4B. What? By the way, that woman is really very sweet. Here's his personnel application. Nice work. Now where will I drop you? I'm going with you. You just said this Newton was kicked out the force for brutality. All the more reason there should be two of them. I think the show has finally taken shape. Morale is way up. New director put back the ballad Tony cut. It's Amanda's one real moment of vulnerability, and the show really needed it. I'll get right to the point, Mr. Walton. I'm told you came by Tony's room just as they were arresting Johnny Whitcomb. Yeah. I was delivering my script changes. I was up all night with him. What do I find? Tony's murdered? Johnny busted for it? <sighs> Talk about shock. I'm also told Tony was pretty hard on you. You or your work. Mr. Mason, I come out of TV where everybody and his astrologer tells you how to do it better. You don't like it, but you get used to it. He intended putting his name on the show as co-author, didn't that bother you? Yeah, well, um, he never got the chance, did he? You couldn't be more right. Whew. 
<laughs> hey, I don't like where you're going. I'll tell you, Mr. Mason, if Tony had really tried something like that, he would have been up to his neck in my lawyers. Wouldn't it still have cast doubt on your ability to write for Broadway? Excuse me. Lieutenant uh, Brock just phoned for you. Um, later, Mr. Mason. Later, Mr. Walton. What did Brock want? They've taken Leslie Singer in for questioning. The composer's wife? Washington finally matched the prints on Tony's glass. They belong to her. I won't let you do it. That's why we're here. It says he's 6'2", weighs 210. An ex-cop who brutalizes people. I'll just ask him a few questions. You know, what if you ask him the wrong one? I'm not imputing your masculinity. I here. knew I shouldn't have let you come. Darling, I only want to help. I mean, I know you and everybody else think I'm just some rich little kid who giggled her way through college, but I'd like to show you that maybe I can really do something. You know, I mean, actually contribute. Look, why don't you sort of think of me as your Della Street? Car. Looks like the security guard business pays better than I thought. Stay put. Dan! Remember brutality! Excuse me. Your name Parker Newton? What the hell is it to you? My name is Kim Alansky. I'm a lawyer. Congratulations, Mr. Kamalansky, but it doesn't exactly answer my question, does it? No. Ken Malansky. I know you said that before. Yeah, well, you see, I work for another lawyer named Perry Mason. You might have heard of him. We represent the man who's accused of killing Tony Franken. So what's that got to do with me? Just want to know what you saw at the theater that night. Not a thing. Like I told the cops, I took over at midnight. See your girlfriend. Funny time for a date, isn't it? Look, Cassie works all day in the dress store. And I was working all night at the theater, so we never get a chance to be together. The band you took off that particular night. Yeah. How was I supposed to know that someone to get murdered? Not a damn thing ever happened in three weeks I was there. Where's your girlfriend work? Me and you just finished talking. I understand you used to be a cop. Look, punk, I told you, get out of my face now. Move. Nice chatting with you.
cheats on me. Yeah, I guessed about her and Tony. But I'll never confront her with that, ever. You see, I won't take the chance of losing her. Most men couldn't live that way. You mean you think I was the one who killed Tony because I was jealous. <laughs> well, why would I? There's always going to be another Tony. good to be true. Well, anyway, she didn't solve much of the puzzle. But somebody did call Tony Franken saying that Amanda Cody had tried to kill herself down at the theater. Franken goes down there. Mrs. Singer doesn't know if it was a man or a woman. Doesn't do very much to get your final hook up information. Apparently not. He, uh, must have got to my place at, uh, 12.15. And, like you said, you know... Spent the whole night together. And you're sure about the time? Oh, I don't know. You know, maybe it was 1220. <laughs> uh, it, it was right around then. Excuse me. Okay. Thanks. Backed up his story. She seemed awfully jittery, though. I think she's lying. Ken, look. Sign. We're out of your mind. Do you want to break this case or not? Of course I do, but I don't want you involved in something dangerous. Looking in that story is not dangerous. Shocking is. Amy, you've never worked a day in your life. Amy! I pay the minimum wage plus a 5% commission. You have a half an hour for lunch. And don't use the phone unless we're on fire. No friends hanging around. And if you're late, it comes out of your pay. Any questions? No. Do you have any experience? Uh, well, uh, let me put it this way. Valentino from the last year's line. Dan Klein. Ongaro. He has some nice and green silk. Donna Karen. Adolfo. Another Valentino. This year's and it's great. She has to be to work for that witch. Anyway, it's like we're old friends. I tell her about us, and she tells me about them. Tell everybody about us. I had to get her confidence, didn't I? And I did. She's told me a lot. Like what? Well, I sometimes she's frightened of Newton. Like, uh, he hates broccoli. Like, he works out at this gym called Harry's every day, and, like, he's not even looking for another job, even though he still talks about getting married. He's not looking for another job, but he is driving a new Corvette. I'd like to get a look at his bank book. I'll see you tonight, okay? And then I discovered the weapon which was hidden in the mini bar in the defendant's hotel room. Lieutenant, I'm now showing you People's Exhibit 9, a 38 caliber revolver which Lieutenant Maxwell of your ballistics department has previously identified as the murder weapon. Is that the weapon you found in the defendant's room? Yes, it is. It has my mark. Were there any fingerprints found on this gun? No, because Whitcomb apparently wiped them off. Objection. Speculation, no foundation. Motion to strike. Sustained. 
The testimony after the witness's response of no is stricken from the record. When you first arrived at the defendant's room, Lieutenant Brock, was the door locked? Uh, yes, it was. We need the manager's master key to get in. You see, it's the type of doors that lock automatically when they're closed. So, if some other person planted the gun in the defendant's room... They would have needed a key to get in. Thank you, Lieutenant. No further questions. Mr. Mason. No questions, Your Honor. <laughs> so, what do you do? Oh, I'm an attorney. Yeah? Yeah. That's well, I guess most lawyers could use the gym. <laughs> All that sitting around on the desk. Believe me, I know. I, I was wondering if you have anything like a trial membership. No. No. Try it out. Right now. No charge. Great. But I didn't bring my gear. But we'll fix you up. Hey, Willie. Hey, where do you see the machines we got? Other gems would kill for. <laughs> yeah, Willie, give Mr. Malinsky here some no, stuff. No, no, uh, Malansky. Malansky, some stuff he can use to work out. Sure, this way. Great, I'll see you later. Yeah. Sir, did the defendant say anything after you pulled him away from Mr. Franken? He said uh, somebody ought to drive a stake through your heart. And then what happened? And Tony asked him if he, Johnny, was going to be the one to do it. And he said, yeah, maybe. No further questions. Your witness, counsel. Mr. Counter, why didn't you object when Franken fired the defendant? I did. I told him that uh, Johnny was a damn fine stage manager. But you're the producer. Surely you could countermand such an arbitrary dismissal. Well, yes, I'm the producer, but uh, ordinarily the director has jurisdiction over the backstage personnel, and uh, I didn't feel that it was my place to interfere. Tony Franken was considering replacing Amanda Cody in your show, wasn't he? You know what we're getting in? Got one of them new bikes with the computer. <laughs> the factory tell you how many days you got to live. <laughs> what are you selling, steroids? You can't afford that stuff, man. <laughs> Come on. You kidding? Membership's up 20% over last month. Maybe even hooked a lawyer today. In fact, I better make sure. Hey, Maliski! Hey, funny you would
We can't hold him, but as long as you better get your butt out of here. What place you got here, Harry? I think I'll pass on the membership. I'll get you, man. I'll get you. Mason. How'd it go today? Very well. The judge is going to allow us to put the victim on trial. The way I hear it, Tony Franken made enemies the way most people make friends. That's what I intend to show. I had a pretty good day myself. I got a look at Parker Newton's checkbook. You know, the security guard? Mm -hmm. There were two recent cash deposits of $25,000 each. The first deposit was made the day after Franken's death. The second deposit yesterday. Nice work. I'm sure getting paid for something. We find out who's paying. We got our killer. We better talk to... Newton officially. Yeah. Get this to the clerk's office, and you take it from there. Newton. Newton. Swell. You see, this is the directory. I enter all my notes and all of the summaries according to the case name. At, at least those for the last couple of years. Of course, if you want all of the cases in here, it's going to take me to the middle of the next century. By that time, computers will be obsolete. They'll be implanting chips in all the odd parts of our brain and skull. I wish they could find some for my knee. So do I. What else? Now, well, let's see... Two of Tony's ex-wives are happily remarried and living in New York. The third is a costume designer in London. And uh, here's a photo staff of that young actress who committed suicide. Her name was Vanessa Grant. She left a note saying she was pregnant and couldn't go on living without Tony. Of course, he denied the whole thing. A real prison. Oh, and look at this. A Blaine counter... His wife died four years ago, and they had a coroner's investigation. Cancer, overdose of sleeping pills, self-administered. So, no charges were brought. No. Oh, something else. James Walton's hotel bill as of yesterday. Some interesting charges, right? Very. Now, why don't you tell your machine everything you just told me, and I'll be back soon. Oh, Della. If the machine comes up with the name of the killer, don't forget to make a note of it. I do for you. You have a few minutes? Oh, sure. Come on in. Uh, coffee? Uh, no, thank you. I don't want to interrupt your work. Oh, I'm uh, just getting started. It's a TV pilot I've got due next week. You're not working on Polly? Oh, no. <laughs> Ever since that last set of rewrites I did, that show has been frozen. Thank God. I'd like to show you something, Mr. Walton. copy of my hotel bill. I just wondered why you've sent Kate Ferrara a dozen roses every night since rehearsals began. So, that's why you dropped by? Well, uh, the roses are part of a promise I made Kate. You see, at first we only wanted her for lead dancer, and she didn't want to do it. I promised if she would, I would send her a dozen roses every night. Well, she finally took the job when Tony let her choreograph, but meanwhile, I was stuck with my promise. Doesn't uh, this indicate more than a professional interest? <sighs> you got me. <laughs> it was more. Does anybody still use the word smitten? She was involved with Tony, wasn't she? What are you getting at? 
You think uh, I killed Tony because I was jealous? <laughs> Mr. Welton, people have killed for a lot less. Mr. Mason, you're barking up the wrong tree. Tony was finished with Kate. At the time he was killed, he was sleeping with Leslie Singer. So if anyone was going to be jealous, it was Mel Singer, not me. Apparently, Mr. Singer has his problems. But then I believe so do you. I still consider both of you suspects. Thank you for your time, Mr. Welch. I have no further questions. Miss Cody, you did not kill Mr. Franken, did you? No. But I can't just sit here. He didn't do it. But all these people out there think that he did. I... Miss Cody, we understand that you love your son. But this is not the way to help him. I'm going to ask you to step down now. I don't know whether the district attorney will be charging you with perjury or not. Your Honor, the district attorney's office has no interest in filing charges against this witness. Can you believe it? She wants $1,400 for this. <laughs> I mean, my boyfriend has to work a whole month for that. What about yours? You for to spring out of the mountain? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, excuse me. Sure. What's the matter? I'm leaving town tonight. What'd you do now? Nothing. It's just getting a little too hot here, that's all. You're in trouble again, aren't you? Listen, no arguments. 
Let's go home with pack and I'll pick you up at your place at six. Baby, it's almost five o'clock. Do it, okay? Look, I got an emergency. I gotta leave early, okay? You can't go. It's still over half an hour before closing. I know. I, I can't help it, okay? I'm sorry. I. I'll see you later. <laughs> Not here, you won't. You're fired. What are you doing? Uh, a wild guess using the phone? No smart mouth remarks, thank you. And I told you, no personal calls. Am I telling you something? You have a terrible attitude problem. And your markups are obscene. <laughs> Tony Franken before, haven't you? Yes, four years ago. And at that time, your wife was quite ill, wasn't she? Yes, she had cancer. And when she learned her cancer was inoperable, you wanted to help her, didn't you? What the hell has this got to do with Tony Franken's murder? Mr. Counter, I'm sorry that I must ask you about this very painful time in your life. But I believe it is relevant to my client's case. <laughs> Your Honor, he has no right. Please answer the question. When my wife learned the cancer was inoperable, she made me promise I'd help her. It was her idea. Help her how, Mr. Counter? Help her to end her suffering when it became too much for her. And eventually, it did become too much for her, didn't it? Yes. So you asked Tony Franken to get you some sleeping pills. I didn't know how else to get them without a prescription, and I knew that Tony was into the drug scene. And then... Look, what I'm going to say might get me in some trouble, but I guess it's about time I got it off my chest. I got the pills from Tony, and I gave them to my wife, and she decided to take them. And to this day, I can't say I'm sorry about it. I mean, she was in such terrible pain. <sighs> anyway, afterwards, everybody thought it was suicide, that she, she did it alone. Everyone except Tony. Is that why you hired him to again direct for you and nobody else would hire him? When he heard I was doing Polly, he hinted that if I didn't hire him, he'd make the whole thing public. And he continued to use that threat against you? At every opportunity. That's why I had to just stand by and let him fire Johnny. And you had no way of knowing, did you, how long he might continue to exercise this power over you? No. And you knew he was planning to fire Amanda Cody, a woman you'd asked to marry you. Yes. Wouldn't you say, Mr. Counter, you had a very strong motive to kill Tony? I'll say this, I've never been happier to see a man dead. At the time of the murder, you were working in your hotel room alone, were you not? Yes, but it would have been very simple, wouldn't it, for you to leave the hotel and return without being seen? Probably, but I never left my room. But you have no witness to confirm that. Mr. Mason, when I first met you, you told us you considered some of us suspects. So I thought I'd better protect myself. 
You see, one of my investors called me that night from Honolulu to find out how the show was doing. Last week, I asked him to send me a copy of his phone bill. He sent me this. Now, it shows a long-distance call from Mr. McQueen directly to my room phone on the night of the murder. And you'll also see that, allowing for the time difference, we spoke from 2.15 a.m. to 2.39 a.m. Mr. McQueen will confirm that he was talking to me during that time period. No further questions? Miss August? No questions. Thank you, Mr. Conner. May we excuse? Goodbye. Ma'am, can you please move your car? Can I have an address? Maybe I'll come visit. We don't have an address. Now move your car. In a minute. No! Sorry, Mr. Mason. Newton died about 20 minutes ago. Didn't he ever regain consciousness? No. Rock had someone by his bed all night long. His girlfriend took it pretty hard, but I think she's going to be okay. That's it. What? You know who did it? 
Ken, I want you to do something for me, and fast. I need you back in the courtroom in 40 minutes. Who are you calling? Brock. I want him to contact the hotel security chief. Lieutenant Brock, please. Brock. Mr. Mason, we're waiting on you. I finally reached Hector's equity. I guess that's right on target. Mr. Mason, is there a problem? Defense calls James Walton. Any word from Ken? Do you solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth? I do. Mr. Walton, you are the book writer of the musical Polly? That's right. How did you get along with Tony Franken? Like most people, I suppose. He wasn't an easy man to like. Mr. Counter testified that he was often very harsh in his criticisms of your work. Yes, he certainly was. That annoyed you, did it not? Of course. But uh, it was just a part of his usual drill. Was his plan to claim co-authorship of the show also part of his drill? Objection. No relevancy. I tend to agree. Objection sustained. Please try to find a more relevant line of questioning, Mr. Mason. Certainly. Mr. Walton, what is the number of your hotel room? I'm in room 611. I would remind the court that Lieutenant Brock has already testified that the defendant's room is 511. Now, Mr. Walton, is there a fire escape outside the window of your hotel? Uh, I'm uh, not sure. Uh, maybe. Let me assure you there is. Just as there is one outside my client's room, just as there is one outside every room ending in the number 11. Objection. Relevancy. Your Honor, I am trying to establish that Mr. Walton's room was directly above that of the defendants, and that therefore Mr. Walton, through their mutual fire escape, had access to the defendant's room. An interesting point, Counselor. But what's your point here? To establish that Mr. Walton could have climbed down that fire escape and while the defendant was passed out planted the murder weapon in the defendant's room and that he, of course, could have returned the same way. Objection overruled. Mr. Walton, did you murder Tony Franken? Did you place the murder weapon in the defendant's room after that murder? I never even saw the murder weapon until this trial. No. I didn't murder Tony Franken. I was in my room the entire night doing the script changes Tony asked for. Mr. Walton, I'm given to understand that television writers are noted for their speed. Isn't it possible you finished those changes earlier than you say, early enough to have lured Tony Franken to the theater and then to have killed him? Objection. The witness has already denied he murdered Tony Franken. Sustained. Mr. Mason, I must say I've been very patient with your questioning of this witness. I appreciate that, Your Honor. But I must ask you to make your examination more on point or finish with him. I'd uh, like to request a moment for a conference with my co-counsel. Granted. But let me remind you, Mr. Mason, the word moment is capable of strict definition. Co-counsel. Of course, co counsel. Sorry about the time. That security bay wasn't too cooperative. It's all right. We're still in business. Uh, we are ready, Your Honor. Please proceed. Walton, do you do your writing on a word processor? No, I do. You saw me working on it. 
Does the program you use put a time and date on each file? I, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, maybe it does. I've never really noticed. Maybe you should have. Would you identify this for us? Yes, this is a printout of my directory. There are some 13 files listed on this directory. After each one, there is a date and a time indicating the last time the file was worked on. Isn't that correct? Um, that's how it works. And here, after the file name Polly, it shows the date. The same date Tony Franken was murdered. Now, what was the hour? <clears throat> One thirty-seven a.m. Well, you did finish your work early. Early enough to have gone to the theater and taken Tony Franken's life. Now, that is true, isn't it? Objection. Asked and answered. Sustained. Is this as far as you can go, Mr. Mason? No, Your Honor. I intend to go a lot farther. Mr. Walton did indeed murder Tony Franken. It's crazy. What the hell motive would I have? Yes, that was also a problem for me. That is, until I had that visit with you in your room yesterday. Look, this was my first Broadway show. Now, now, why would I kill the director that was going to take it to Broadway and make it a hit and make me a fortune? A good point, Mr. Walton. No, you wouldn't kill such a man. But you would kill a man who was responsible for the death of your sister. Mr. Walton, can you identify the people in that picture? It's uh, <clears throat> myself, my sister, and um, my parents. Thank you. Hold on to that. I am now showing you a copy of a New York Examiner article and a photograph of a young woman that accompanies it. Can you tell me what the headline says? Actress commits suicide. And that actress was Vanessa Grant, and Vanessa Grant was really Edith Walton, and Edith Walton was really your sister, isn't that true? Yes, it's, it's true. I'm now showing you People's Exhibit 9. Identified as the murder weapon. You recognize it, don't you? No, no. Here, take it. Now, do you recognize it? No. Your Honor... I would like to excuse this witness, subject to recall. Call Mr. Parker Newton to the stand. I'll get him, Mr. Mason. He's waiting out in the hall. All right. I'll ask you again, Mr. Walton. Have you ever seen that gun before? This is the gun 